In the annals of ancient Judah, nestled within the annals of its kings, stood Hezekiah, a figure whose life wove a tapestry of faith, adversity, and the clash of empires. His story, a blend of divine intervention and human frailty, echoed through the corridors of time. Hezekiah, whose name means God strengthens, emerged as a pivotal figure in the Old Testament of the Bible. Born as the son of King Ahaz, he ascended to the throne, becoming the 13th king of Judah around 715 BC, reigning for approximately 29 years in Jerusalem. He inherited a kingdom in disarray. His father had led Judah into a spiralling descent of idolatry and moral decay. An evil king, who God was very displeased with, and allowed King Aram to defeat him in battle. He practised a lot of destructive practices, such as idol worship and sacrilege against the temple of the Lord. He turned completely from God, which is odd, considering that his grandfather, King Jotham, was a good king. Jotham, the father of King Ahaz and the grandfather of Hezekiah, is generally depicted as a king who followed the ways of God and did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. According to the biblical accounts found in 2 Kings 15, 32, 38 and Sebuth Chronicles 27, Jotham ruled over Judah for 16 years and during his reign he sought to govern justly and according to the principles of God's law. He built and fortified cities in Judah and engaged in various construction projects. Jotham's commitment to the worship of Yahweh is highlighted, indicating that he walked in the ways of his father, King Uzziah, who had initially been faithful to God before being struck with leprosy due to his prideful actions in the temple. Though the biblical narratives about Jotham are relatively brief, they generally paint him as a king who followed God's commands, upheld justice, and contributed to the stability and prosperity of Judah during his reign. So, it is unclear why his son, King Ahaz, departed so completely from the teachings of the Lord, or perhaps he had bad influence. Upon ascending the throne in Jerusalem, Hezekiah faced a daunting task, to untangle the web of religious malaise and restore the worship of Yahweh, the God of Israel. With a resolute heart, he embarked on a journey of reform. Temples were cleansed, idols smashed, and the people were called to return to the ancient faith. Hezekiah's fervour for revival breathed life into a kingdom clouded by spiritual darkness. However, as rays of hope began to pierce through Judah's gloom, shadows of a different kind loomed on the horizon. The Assyrian cast its covetous gaze upon Judah's lands. In a swift and forceful sweep, the mighty Assyrian Empire, led by King Sennacherib, conquered ten tribes of Israel within three years. Hezekiah, the king of Judah, watched with a heavy heart as this tumultuous event unfolded. Knowing all too well that the two remaining tribes of Judah would likely be the next target. These harrowing events that befell the Northern Kingdom served as a stark reminder of the perilous consequences resulting from straying from the faithfulness to God. As the people turned away from their true devotion and worshipped other gods, the Southern Kingdom of Judah gleaned a grim lesson from the calamities that ensued. The devastating onslaught by the Assyrians demonstrated a grim fate that awaited those who disobeyed God's commands. The people of the Northern Kingdom were not any less descendants of Abraham than were the people of the Southern Kingdom. Because of this, the people of Judah were able to see quite plainly that they would also be subject to judgment if they stopped listening to and obeying the commands of God. The Assyrians, notorious for their brutality and cruelty, brought terror through their widespread conquests. When King Sennacherib set his sights on the fortified cities of Judah, save for Jerusalem, fear gripped Hezekiah. In a desperate plea for mercy, Hezekiah reached out to the Assyrian king saying, I have done wrong, withdraw from me, and I will pay whatever you demand of me. Despite the capture of all other fortified cities, Jerusalem remained the last stronghold. Hezekiah, anxious for the safety of his people, offered a tribute tax to the Assyrian, depleting the treasures of the kingdom and the temple in hopes of securing Judah's safety. But this act of appeasement only emboldened the Assyrians, leading to further impoverishment and intensifying their aggression against Judah. Desperate for protection, Hezekiah forged an alliance with Egypt, seeking aid against the looming threat. 
However, Prophet Isaiah warned against placing trust in foreign powers, urging Judah to rely on the Lord instead of seeking refuge elsewhere. As Sennacherib besieged Jerusalem, the city found itself trapped, its inhabitants surrounded and cut off from essential supplies. Hunger became a cruel weapon, employed to weaken the defenders and force them into submission, a siege tactic that often brought cities to their knees. Then, Sennacherib dispatched his most prominent officials, the supreme commander, his chief officer and his field commander. Along with a substantial army from Lachish to Jerusalem, the field commander representing the Assyrian king, Sennacherib. Scaling the mountain, they arrived in Jerusalem and stationed themselves by the aqueduct of the upper pool. The field commander, seemingly in control, positioned himself at Jerusalem's vital water source, crucial during times of siege. Three Jerusalem officials, Eliakim, the palace administrator, Shebna, the secretary, and Joah, son of Asaph, the recorder, went out to meet them. Despite the tribute tax offered to dissuade the Assyrian advance, the field commander conveyed a message to Hezekiah on behalf of the great king of Assyria. Asserting counsel and might for war, he aimed to discredit Judah's reliance on Egypt, likening it to a fragile reed that would only injure those who leaned upon it. He sought to sever Judah's confidence in their alliance with Egypt, despite the seeming logic, in forming a defensive pact with the only nation potent enough to counter the formidable Assyrians. Rather than making a direct advance, the Rabshakeh, also the field commander, used intimidation and discouragement as his tactics. Despite the overwhelming power of the Assyrian army, the Rabshakeh employed psychological warfare, aiming to induce a fear, discouragement, and despair within Judah, coaxing them to surrender without a fight. Mocking Judah's comparatively smaller army, he taunted that even if they were given thousands of horses, it wouldn't make a difference. His underlying message implied Assyria's superiority, intended to instill dread among the leaders and people of Judah. He vehemently proclaimed in Hebrew, discrediting Hezekiah's reassurances of God's deliverance, urging surrender to the king of Assyria. The commander's speech was a calculated attempt to elevate the enemy and undermine the trust of God's people in their leaders. His words were meant to sow seeds of doubt, engender fear, and advocate surrender among the people of Judah, making them believe that capitulation would be advantageous. Hezekiah, not knowing what to do next, turned to God in prayer. O sovereign God, whose might and mercy surpass all earthly power and strife, I come before you humbled and burdened by the weight of our circumstances. As the tumult of the Assyrian threat engulfs our land, my heart seeks your divine guidance and intervention. Almighty and compassionate Lord, you have witnessed the taunts and threats of the Rabshakeh, the intimidation that seeks to undermine the faith of your people. I stand bewildered and uncertain in the face of this overwhelming adversary, unsure of the path to tread amidst the chaos that looms over us. You, who parted the seas and led your people to safety, whose deliverance has been the anthem of our ancestors' praise. I beseech you to hear my fervent cry. Grant me wisdom, O God, to discern your will amidst this turmoil. Strengthen my resolve and grant me courage to lead your people through this time of turmoil. You are the God of our forefathers, the one who delivered us from bondage and the cornerstone of our hope. Extend your merciful hand over us, fortify our defences and shield us from the enemy's schemes. In this moment of uncertainty, I seek your divine assurance that you, in your immeasurable grace, shall be our refuge and strength. Grant us your divine favour that we may stand firm in faith, unshaken by fear, knowing that you are our fortress and our deliverer. Into your hands I commit the fate of your people and the defence of Jerusalem. May your name be exalted and your sovereignty acknowledged. Now and forevermore. Amen. After he finished praying, God sent prophet Isaiah to Hezekiah, saying, Thus says the Lord, Do not be afraid, because of the words that you have heard with which the servants of the king of Assyria have blasphemed me. Behold, I will put a spirit in him, so that he will hear a rumour and return to his own land, and I will make him fall by the sword in his own land. 
He will not enter this city or shoot an arrow here. By the way that he came, he will return, declares the Lord. True to the prophecy of Isaiah, upon hearing that the king of Assyria had moved from Lachish and was engaged in battle against Libna, the Rabshakeh of the Assyrian army withdrew with a portion of his forces. That night, the angel of the Lord went out and put to death 185,000 soldiers in the Assyrian camp. When the children of Judah got up the next morning, they found 185,000 soldiers in the Assyrian camp, all dead. It only took one strike from the Lord's angel to rid Judah of its foe, 185,000. Assyrian soldiers were slayed in an instant. The Assyrian, like Goliath the Philistine who mocked the Lord, had been defeated. Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, retreated to Nineveh, defeated and humiliated. However, his downfall didn't end there. One day, while he was worshipping in the temple of his god Nisroch, his sons, Adramelech and Sharazah, killed him with the sword, and they escaped to the land of Ararat. And Esarhaddon, his son, succeeded him as king. The victory was unquestionably God's doing, for without the need for weapons or warfare, the unstoppable Assyrian force had been stopped and the seemingly invincible had been defeated. God's divine intervention had saved Judah from destruction, delivering them from their enemies and securing their safety without a single arrow being fired against Jerusalem. Following the astounding defeat of the Assyrian army and the demise of King Sennacherib, tranquility descended upon Jerusalem. A personal trial befell Hezekiah, afflicted by a grave illness that threatened to snatch away his breath. Prophet Isaiah delivers a solemn message to Hezekiah saying, Thus says the Lord, set your house in order, for you shall die and not live. Hezekiah's heart was filled with sorrow and distress at the prospect of facing death. Despite the recent victory against the Assyrians, the news of his impending demise weighed heavily on his spirit. Hezekiah, a king known for his righteousness and devotion to God. He turned towards the wall and prayed to the Lord, saying, Remember now, O Lord, I pray, how I have walked before you in truth and with a loyal heart and have done what was good in your sight. He wept bitterly, beseeching God to reconsider and grant him more time to live. In response to Hezekiah's heartfelt prayers, God, in his infinite mercy, heard and acknowledged Hezekiah's plea. Moved by his sincerity and devotion, responded through prophet Isaiah again, promising to extend Hezekiah's life by 15 more years. Hezekiah's reign highlights the importance of placing trust in God, even in the face of overwhelming challenges. Despite threats and imminent danger, he consistently sought God's guidance and protection, showcasing unwavering faith. The power of prayer, Hezekiah's earnest prayers serve as a testament to the potency of sincere and heartfelt communication with God. His prayers for healing and deliverance exemplify the efficacy of seeking God's intervention in times of distress.